Welcome to Diminishing Returns, the podcast where we discuss a film or franchise and then pitch our own ideas for sequels. This week, we're anticipating the release of the Jumanji reboot by revisiting the film that started it all back in 1995. If you enjoy this episode, then please do help us spread the word by sharing with your friends and loved ones during this season of goodwill. All we want for Christmas is more listeners. This episode contains spoilers for Jumanji, Zatura, and James and the Giant Peach. Enjoy! Welcome to Diminishing Returns. We're here again. We're a fast approaching Christmas. But before we get onto our Christmas special episode, we're going to deal with uh, fun for all the family, a bank holiday favourite. It's Jumanji. And with me, Alan, is Calvin. Yes, hello. And Saul. Hello. We're dealing with Jumanji not just because it's a family favourite film, but because... The new Jumanji, because <laughs> that's normally what we <laughs> yeah look we at, usually look family at family favorites. We've done st- we've just done three Star Wars. Yeah, things, we we say. did Minions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Despicable Me, Pink Flamingos. <laughs> that uh, was a big family favorite. Psycho. Um, so, so uh, a new Jumanji film is coming out. Uh, it's kind of a sequel, though. I don't think it's particularly connected to the original story. It's just a oh look, it's a game. Uh, th- yeah, from what I've heard, I think it might have a bit more connective tissue than they're letting on. Is it? I bet it's just some sort of token tissue. Yeah, probably. I, I don't know. Like the the very fact that they feel the need to position it as a sequel in the first place, because I just thought it was a remake or just a reimagining. Mm. And the fact that they are sort of selling it as a sequel, I, I I find interesting. It was greenlit as a remake, and there was a big backlash, and they uh, reworked it a little bit, I believe, which makes sense because there's absolutely no reason to not just make it a sequel. Really, it's so well there is actually, and I guess we'll get into that after we've uh, talked about the proper film. Should we do that first? Or you you, you say you say backlash there? I, like, am I missing something? Is this film like a beloved like I yeah? Um, well, it is in my house film. I, Absolutely. Yeah, children of the 90s love them some Jumanji. Mm. Well, actually, mm. let's let's get back to this original film, because you guys are younger than me, and, and we've dealt with this before. Uh, you guys are like Power Rangers and Pokemon and that sort of thing. But no, when, I don't. But when, <laughs> but when, when Jum- I like good stuff, like Jumanji. <laughs> Calvin was busy watching shit like Power Rangers. That's why he doesn't know, like doesn't understand people enjoying bloody Jumanji. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I didn't say that. I just, I don't think of it... It's not like a Mrs. Doubtfire. Oh, God, it is. It's absolutely on par with Mrs. Doubtfire. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, look, my point is, right, so uh, when this film came out, I was 11, I think, uh, and I remember seeing this film at a cinema, and I saw very, very few films at a cinema when I was a kid, because when I was that age, uh, like, my parents just didn't take us to the cinema, and I wasn't old enough to go on my own. So this is one of very few films I remember seeing as a child. I don't really remember if I really loved it then or not, but I've seen it a couple of times since, and I really like it. I think it really, mm. and it still stands up 20 years later. I, I, was, I was stand yeah. by it, and I would recommend it to any sort of, you know, 10-year-old particularly, but I think it's, it's a good, good watch for an adult as well. I had a similar, yeah, experience. I mean, I, I don't think I saw it in the cinema when I was younger. I think I saw it as soon as it came out on video, and I definitely saw it a lot as a child at, at friends' houses and stuff. But I, I rewatched it for the first time in, in probably well over a decade, uh, a few days ago. And yeah, it, it holds up remarkably well. It mm. was every bit as fun and just a joy, joyful experience as I remembered it being as a kid. Calvin, you're obviously going to be the resident grouch this week. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> what's your problem with Jumanji, man? Uh, I mean, I don't have a problem with it. I think this is going to be one of those cases where I'm just more indifferent on something and therefore come across as the grouch. Like, I I think it's fine. I don't love it or hate it. Again, We I, I think I probably saw it on video. This is one of the first films that I remember, like, being 
seeing a lot of the promotional stuff for though i remember being very conscious of it when hmm. i was like six years old like i remember specifically seeing a lot of behind the scenes footage of robin williams really? when he's like in the floor you know when his head his face is just sticking out of the floor and like yeah. the crocodiles in the house at the end and all that for some reason i remember seeing a lot of behind the scenes stuff about that maybe it was on the video that we had as like a feature i don't know but um it took me a long time to actually like the film i think and i did watch it a couple of times when i was younger because um i think the first time i watched it it terrified me i was about to say i bet you were scared you fucking knobhead no, those mosquitoes <laughs> are really scary i, I couldn't cope with them it, it was I, I it's there's some legitimate peril in this film and i oh, really yeah, yeah, like yeah. it for that i really think it's great the way that it doesn't kind of sugarcoat that yeah, like those mosquitoes, those spiders, um, sort of the effect that the the plague the mosquitoes are, are carrying has on mm. people. Yeah, um, I really did. Oh, like and the and the the, the man eating plant as well is is well, like yeah, it all yeah, just all the stuff about thing you know things wanting to eat people. Like I, I had a big fear when I was one of my earliest fears was uh, being eaten by wolves. <laughs> I think it's because <laughs> I think it's because I went to a I went to a Christian school and like wolves are everywhere what? eating everything in what? the Bible. No, they're not. Like, <laughs> the, the boy who cried wolf. That's not in the Bible. In the Bible. Oh right. Oh. <laughs> you were doing uh, really shit. Did you? <laughs> so, hang on. Hang on. Did you think the boy who cried wolf? <laughs> Was it was part of the Bible? You, There's a lot of shit in there. Jesus that cries wolf. <laughs> yeah, the, the boy who cried wolf's too good a story. Yeah, it has a, to be it has in the a Bible, much. Quite it has a very it's clear like, moral it's lesson. Got a good moral. <laughs> it's, it's like well structured and works as a narrative. It, the Bible's <laughs> just a big list of like people who lived to be nine hundred years old, and then the kids they had and. No. There's that stuff about, like, all those people that were having sex, and then, like, that chap and his wife left, and then she turned back and she turned into sand. Like... Salt. <laughs> salt, salt, right. But, <laughs> but there you go. See, You see how little that story makes any sense, <laughs> compared to the sort of nice little simple narrative of the boy mm. who cried wolf. Boy lies, mm. gets his comeuppance, done. I was a very sensitive child, and I couldn't quite handle the amount of peril. And it's not just like the like all the giant monsters that are going to eat you, but it's just this film just has a vibe. Mm. Oh There's god, it's, it's like even really when... dark. I've made that in my notes. It's it's yeah. it's. I love that though, and on the rewatch, that I was so impressed because this film doesn't sugarcoat any of it. It really like. It, no, no, it, it really doesn't. It, it really dwelt like Robin. I mean, at the end, there's a happy ending, and I kind of wish there wasn't as happy an ending, mm. but. For for the mm. bulk of the film, like Robin Williams' character, what's he called? Alan is he? Alan Farish. He just loses his childhood, and his mm. parents go to the grave thinking that their child hated them and ran away and died. And it's it's this mm. like really tragic story that's just kind of. Oh, I yeah. mean, it's it's largely glossed over, but they give it enough attention to you know it's quite affecting. Um, and as a kid as well, mm. it really spoke to me as a kid because you know the 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 notion that like your parents are gonna think you you know ran away and hated them and you know it's a lot of like stuff that I think speaks to the experience of being a child there and it's um i think they probably justified all that by sort of erasing yeah. it all at the end like even um kirsten dunst and the, the her brother like their parents mm. are dead like and they're living yeah. with their aunt and she's obviously trying to make the best of it but mm. it's not quite you know working out it's just i don't know and like what happens to um what's her name sarah is it sarah the uh, girlfriend mm, yeah, yeah 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 not very pleasant things happening to people until like five minutes and fair enough it's resolved well but... it's yeah but it's it feels a lot more authentic as a result a lot of these kinds of films mm. would feel insincere and and contrived and unrealistic because they wouldn't dare to mm. to be as mean to its characters. And it, it never feels relentless to me in this film. It just feels very much like, yeah, that's probably what what would happen there. That's probably how that would play out. I thought the same about Robin Williams, his performance. Especially when you, you've got someone like Robin Williams, it could go so mm. over the top, so comedy. Oh, yeah. But he does really ground it in reality. There's a, 
And mm. and like especially when he first comes out of the jungle, he's in the silly costume and he's running around. That's what kind of gets it out of his system. And after yeah. that, he's quite serious. And and I think that works. Well, yeah, I think that's a good I... thing. It brings real gravity to it. I remember this film being far more of a Robin Williams tour de force. The only scene that really stuck in my head was the one where the monkeys are stealing the police car and he's shouting at the yeah. police car and the guy thinks he's, you know, the mad old uncle who's come back from uh, wherever it was he's been. And it, that that was what I was expecting for the majority of the film. But you, you're right, it's a very toned down performance, really. It's uh, just pitched at the right level, mm. I think. He, he does have those moments, but it's not over the top. It, it never feels like, oh, it's a Robin Williams vehicle. It just feels like he's in this film mm. playing a part. Yeah. The other the other sort of broad stroke I wanted to make a note of was there's really not much here. There's not a lot of backstory. We don't get any reason why this mm. game exists. And even the and even the characters mm. themselves don't get a huge amount of backstory. We get Alan Parrish set up, but you know, these kids, they just mm. sort of introduce you, oh yeah, their parents are dead, so they're a bit weird. They go. And it's like, we, we get straight into the action and straight on with it. Mm. And um, I think that's to its credit, because it works as that fast-paced kind of action film. It's a really classic mm. Hollywood film, I think, because it's really stri- yeah. it's kind of stripped down, but it works. It's got all the components that are supposed to be there, mm. and they're done well. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. And, and talking about that very classic Hollywood feel, I, I guess it's worth pointing out that it is a Joe Johnston joint mm. um was it his first film don't think so no yeah. he'd done the rocketeer before this hadn't he is that uh, honey i shrunk the kids was his first film ah. followed oh. by rocketeer yeah see but i mm. i didn't know that going in, like i completely forgotten he was involved going into the rewatch i had no idea who he was as a kid so that didn't mean anything to me um, I mean, I, I guess in 1995 or six or seven, he wasn't anyone particularly notable. Anyway, um, I think he was sort of a, he was seen as a bit of a Steven Spielberg. Yeah, protege. he was one of those. Like, yeah, Spielberg yeah. I mean, he junior, came he? from. Yeah, he worked on yeah. Star Wars, didn't he? Return of the Jedi, yeah. and that's kind of how he got into the industry. Mm. And, um, I remember this being a very functional Hollywood film, and I was getting really impressed with the direction on the rewatch. And I, I looked up, you know, partway through the, I think it was a scene when the lion was introduced, and you've got this shot of these, yeah. this shadow, and then these paws kind of step into frame on the the piano, and it. I thought like this is really nicely put together. Like there's some really good effects work combined with you know clever shots, and it's just done really well and I, I looked it up and it was like oh of course it's joe johnston this this feels like the archetypical joe johnston film in hindsight mm, um mm. yeah yeah but i think it really is him at his best to be honest it's it's everything good about his style of filmmaking which is very hollywood but it is it's very spielberg that's a good reference point because yeah. spielberg yeah. does hollywood and he does it well we've discussed this before but like he doesn't break the mold, but he makes it as good as it can be, and this is very much in that yeah, vein, yeah. I think. Yeah. So my one, probably my biggest problem with this film is that it opens on a, a prelude set in eighteen sixty nine of some people burying the game, and they say, you know, what happens if someone digs it up? God help us all, uh, <laughs> or may have, may yeah. God have mercy on their soul, whatever they say. Then we get another prelude set in 1969, establishing our uh, protagonist, Robin Williams, Alan Shepard. Alan and Parrish. then we jump for Alan Parrish. Alan Shepard was uh, flying to the sort of into space in 1969. He's an astronaut. Shit, he was, wasn't he? <laughs> good, good god. topical reference though. 1969. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, why is he in my head? Anyway, um. Then we jump forward to 1995 or whenever it was set. And it, it just, why, it just feels so messy to have two prelude sequences. It, it feels like there's too many thresholds that the film's going through. And that opening one in 1869, I don't know what it's adding. I don't know why we don't just open I, I, in 1969 and he finds this mythical game that... I think it's more of a mood setter. I think the film would feel very different if it opened with Alan running away from his bullies and going to see the, his dad at the shoe shop and all that kind of stuff. I think that 1960s tone is the tone the film strives for, though. It just feels out of place with that other thing. I don't know. I think it just establishes me. it straight away. It's like, hey, look, this is the Jumanji thing. It's dangerous. Okay, go. It's kind of, it's just sort of, it's yeah. what's, what the hell is Jumanji? If you're watching this film, you're just like, what? 
I I just think it's I think it's messy. I think it's it's not the one thing that struck me as just kind of bad. I mean, not only that, but that must have been a really recently made game in 1869 because it's it's like colonial <laughs> safari themed. So there's a you know there's a hunter in, in there and everything. So it just about works, but it couldn't be like more than a few years old at, at that point. Who's to say that the game was based on colonial uh, safari? Maybe you know Jumanji is its own world, presumably. Because well, there's a its own sort well, there's a alternate because there's a British uh, hunter who comes out of it who's like got an old elephant rifle. They can exist in separate dimensions. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I, I mean, I I could go with the idea that the game kind of just updates and evolves with the time, like magically, but only ever a um, hundred years behind. Yeah. <laughs> you know, perhaps it takes on characteristics of the uh, era in which it was last played. You don't really know, to be honest, but probably probably best not to think about it in too much detail, to be honest. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because then we quickly get into the emotional story, which is um, Alan Parrish is being picked on and his dad's quite tough with him and he tells him to he must face his fears and confront them head on, be a man, all that sort of stuff. Then when he does confront the bullies, he gets beaten up. Mm. This All this stuff feels very just on the nose for me. It's like, oh, we're going to send you to military school or whatever it is. It, well, it's all a bit... But it's, I think they're trying to pack everything into 10 minutes and it just feels a bit yeah, like I, boom, boom, boom to me. But I, I understand. I why. sort of felt like that a bit, but then it all pays off really nicely. You know, the fact that he doesn't own up for ruining that guy's shoes is like quite a big mm. plot element down the line. And there's a lot of... The thing I'll say about being sent off to um, boarding school as well is it's, you know, it's it's ultimately fairly low stakes, but I remember as a kid that seemed like such a big deal. The idea of being sent away to, you know, some boarding school you wouldn't want to, uh, you know, not seeing your family or your friends or whatever mm. for long stretches. It, it's, it's genuinely quite upsetting to a child. And again, I think this does a really good job of meeting kids at their level without talking down to them. Mm. So the, the the character that I mentioned before, um, who's introduced partway through the game, one of the many mm. uh, parts of the game coming to life and threatening them, is a, a hunter who is hunting Alan, and the implication is has been for decades, but uh, basically just wants to shoot him. But he's played by the guy who plays the father in a mm. really odd... Jonathan Hyde. Yeah, it's a really yes. odd dual role. And I, I never really picked up on it as a kid that that was even a thing. Mm, me neither. I, I was going to ask, either, actually. No. Yeah. But, it, but it makes perfect sense in the... Thematically, it yeah. kind of does. It, it feels like they never quite lean on it yeah. enough to make sense that they did it in the first place to me. But they never play it as like, oh, this is a cipher for your father. It's just the yeah. same actor and it's just I guess it, it does feel like it's it's they've kind of half gone into something and they're not quite committed mm. to it. But it's still, it still it, it feels it, like there's a cut scene somewhere yeah, that maybe yeah. plays off it a bit mm. more and they felt it was a bit too much and I think it does kind of pay off toward like at the very yeah. end when he confronts him and he has that you need to face your fears and all that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah. And it, it's it's kind of nice that, you know, he's facing his fear, his fear is his dad, yeah. all that kind of stuff. But, but yeah. um, do you guys know where the story of Jumanji comes from? So I was reading about it earlier. Oh, no, I just thought it was this film. It was a, it, yeah, yeah, it was, it was a children's book. Well, I thought it was an original screenplay oh. because it seems like a very filmic idea. But it was, mm. uh, yeah, a picture book. And from what I've read on the Wikipedia thing, it seems like a very basic children's yeah. story. And there's nothing about Alan Parrish or anything like that. It's two kids, they play a game, they get sucked into this jungle world, they have, they come across several scary things, and then they get out. And so the whole kind of huh. emotional arc of it, and all the Alan Parrish stuff, is is the the fiction of the film and is is you know that's the original screenplay but i think it's mm. a great way of taking mm. a, a quite a neat idea and making it into something better making it something yeah, bigger definitely. and more filmic anyway so so then what happens there the we cut to the oh no we've missed the main bit uh the drums yeah. alan finds the game which is something else that this really creeps me out even now it's like that sort of rhythmic like <laughs> drum sound really does Ethnic something to me. Music. Something... I was going to say, I think that, that's just <laughs> no, some weird no, racist holdover <laughs> in your like, psyche. Oh my God. 
No, it isn't. There's there's this film, and I I can't remember what it was called. I saw it in BBC. Was it was it one of those old uh, cannibal like movies <laughs> where some white people go into the into the jungle and get eaten? Well, I mean, it was kind of not far <laughs> off. Uh, basically, a plane crashed, and all these people were like in the jungle, and there were these like cannibal tribes around the uh, uh, the crash site and you never see them you never see anything of them all you hear is the drums and you know they're getting close when you hear the drums and stuff and it's still there's just something about it that's really um, I don't know impending doomish uh, and I, I, I but I think it's very effective like when he hears the call of the drums and he what is what are we supposed to believe it is that's calling him to the game I mean what do you mean by effective because I didn't even take it as like meant to be scary. No, I mean, okay, maybe scary isn't the right word. Like, I don't think you should be cowering under the sofa at the sound of it, but some, there's something unsettling about it, I would say. I didn't know, but I mean, I didn't even get that from it. But what did you get from it? Oh, it's a magic board game. What's this magic treasure that's calling no, out No, 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 but that specific choice of sound... Jungle themed. ...that attracts him to it. Like, what do you think it's supposed to evoke? Like... Oh, odd. There's a weird jungle noise coming from over here. Mm. I don't know. Maybe maybe it is meant to be unsettling and unnerving, and I'm just not racist. But uh, that's is nothing about how can, how can the sound of a musical instrument make someone <laughs> racist or not? That's just ridiculous. Yeah. No, I I just I I think that you are scared of drums because you subconsciously perhaps associate them with the idea of the you know what's the word savage. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> tribesmen who aren't, you know, part of society. Whoa, you're projecting so much. I think this is saying more about you <laughs> than well, it is about, me that I, you're projecting this no, 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 much no, no, onto I, I me, saying say... that, the, that the rhythm of these particular drums is ominous and uh, foreboding. I, I, I just genuinely, I mean, genuinely, I'm not winding you up when I say I genuinely never even took the drums as intended as... Well, what what do you think it's supposed to be conveying? Because it's a very specific sound. It can't just be, oh, he hears, it could it could be any sound, could it? Could it be a slide whistle? Could it be violins? Actually, could yeah. it be like, guitar? I think, I think the film would work roughly the same if it had just been, like, they hear noise of the jungle, as in, like the bird song and the kind of kind of like I agree and 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 that would also have been ominous and foreboding I let me think. let me g- at all, um, gentlemen Why? gentlemen gentlemen let me let me step into the between you here as a voice of reason let us look at the evidence presented to us in the film how do people react to hearing the noise uh, first of all alan parish hears the noise and he goes straight to it and he finds out where it's coming from he's not no, he's not scared he's not scared it. he's curious but then the the two children hear it, and the boy is kind of scared enough that he pretends he's not because he, he hears heard it. because he hears it in his attic, and he's like, "Who the fuck is in the attic?" Yeah, exactly. The scary part there is that it's something in the attic. But when they kind of go, "Yes, we definitely heard something," they immediately run up to the attic to explore what it is. They're not, and when they find that it was the board game, they're like, "Oh, cool." Yeah, they they don't go. Isn't that weird that a board game was making a noise that we could hear three stories? Well, it's all microchips or something, isn't it? It's all like magnets or something. I love that line. They blame (laughs) it on microchips, and it's like I can't tell how much of that is a joke and how much of it was sincere nineties. Yeah, in nineteen ninety five, not understanding how computers work. (laughs) That's the thing. I know this. Uh, So anyway, I think. They don't find it scary, but I agree with Calvin. I think it's an ominous sound. I think ominous is probably a word rather than scary. Calvin, I think what Saul's trying to say that if you were, if when you were growing up, you watched loads of films about uh, a tribe in the Amazon or whatever who were like making beads and making baskets out of reeds and stuff like that, and then they're playing the drums, boom, 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 they're having a little dance. That's what you'd associate it with, and therefore yeah. it wouldn't be ominous. So the the, the sort of just the noise itself is not ominous. It's exactly. ominous because of the cultural baggage that you bring to it. Which is largely a sense of the unknown. It's largely, oh, what is that? Why are they doing that? It's No, it's just uh, it's just the instrument is ominous and foreboding. No, it it's like so, okay, okay, so, <laughs> so, so what, what why why do why do violins evoke a certain um Emotion. They don't then. Or like... it depends very specifically on how they're used. You have to make a you have to make a very specific shriek noise. Yeah, exactly, with the which you do with the instrument. He's not talk, he's not saying a violin is scary. He's saying that music you can play with a violin can cause an emotional effect. And the same with drums. Yes. Our entire perception of music is nurture rather than nature. 
and it comes down to our cultural awareness because there there are certain like cultures and stuff where they don't perceive what we perceive to be sad music to be sad music it's a learned thing you learn that these particular notes and things evoke happiness evoke sadness and it's all to do with association well i think you're 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 giving a sort of definite answer here to something that doesn't really have a definite answer I think music mm. has different effect on people. If Calvin heard that and found it ominous, then he found it ominous. That's that's the way it goes. What about the um, the Jaws theme? Right, we that is an ominous sound. We associate it with sharks now, but when that film was first released, that wasn't that was created for that. So when people were watching that, and the reason that that music was composed for that scene was because it created ominosity. It created dread and fear. But we've all grown up with shared experiences and not shared experiences. So there are, like, inherently, there's going to be things that every single human being learns. I mean, God, that one of the big things with music, like, to do with the rhythms and stuff, is that it's basically, a lot of people believe it's set by the heartbeat and the noises you hear in the womb as a child. Now, that that is a thing that is learnt, Um that's nurture rather than nature, but it's something universal because we all start off in a womb listening to a heartbeat. And I'm saying that the fact that you find tribes drums ominous is almost certainly the result of like however many years of colonial oppression and fear of the other. Like Not when I was like six, seven years old watching this for the first time, having not seen Cannibal Holocaust or any other cannibal tribes films anything like that it's i just thought i, I was i was just i was just paying it a compliment i thought that the fucking drum beat was <laughs> ominous and created a good mood like ugh. i'm bored of the drums now anyway what happens after the drums he takes the game home and they play it <laughs> all right uh, so <clears throat> he finds the game he's obviously very excited because board games are still cool in 1969 Takes it home, meets up with a local girl, uh, and is like, oh, come around and play this board game, they're cool. The game, we, we get the sense that the game is magic, and it's it's kind of like, it's not real, is it? It's got this kind of thing in the middle that glows and gives you words. It's obviously not like a 1960s technology kind of thing. So we're getting a sense that this game is a bit more ominous than we first thought. They carry on playing. They they get attacked by some bats. Well, they, they roll the dice and a little message appears, like a magic eight ball, and it says something like, watch out for these bats. They're not rats. <laughs> and then like they, they look and it's a load of bats. And they're like, whoa. <laughs> they didn't put a lot of effort into these r- rhyming couplets. <laughs> <laughs> what does it say? Um, no, I can't remember what it says. Uh, but so yeah, bats. They're scared by bats. Then Alan has his go, and I know what this one says: "In the jungle, you must wait until the dice read five or eight. Then he turns into dodgy nineties special effects, and uh, I don't know that's dodgy at all. He gets sort of sucked into a warp. This looks it's pretty good, probably though. the weakest effect in the film. The, oh, the monkeys are the shittest effect. <laughs> yeah. That's all right. That one he gets sucked in. No, because they they've got some Invisible Man stuff going for him, where they've like you know, moved something on a string and then had to kind of make the thing move around it that kind of makes up for the fact that they look a bit crap. I I think the effects are really good in this film, all things considered, for when it was made. I think they hold up pretty well. Yeah, that was Mm. one of my broad things. I think along with the first Jurassic Park film, it's... I don't know if it was just these, like, very early films when they were Mm. sort of doing this kind of CG for the first time that they just put more effort into it's it. It's minimal CGI I, I in the know. film as well. Like it, it, I'd say it's predominantly animatronic, the, the effects work. Mm, similar to Jurassic Park yeah, in that way. Yeah. It's like there, is, there isn't, in the first one, there isn't that many CG shots. It is yeah. largely models and... I think... Yeah. But it's still I all think good. Like, in this, yeah. so you, there's a few shots where things are CG'd, but I think predominantly it's just the mosquitoes and they move too quickly to see them properly to kind of go, oh, that looks crap. Mm. And the monkeys that do look crap, but like I say, they've got the kind of Invisible Man movie thing on their side, so when they open a drawer, like, the actual drawer opens, and that kind of makes it feel more real and get away with it more than it otherwise would. When they're riding on a policeman's bike, you know, that is a real, it's not a CGI bike that Mm. they're sat on. 
Um, and I think that makes a world of difference for it. So Alan gets sucked into the board game. The girl panics. She gets attacked by bats, runs off, has a mental breakdown for 30 years. <laughs> and and then we cut mm. forward to 1995? 26 years later. Mm. Yeah, so, so new kids show up. The house, they've got the house for cheap because of what happened there. They're orphans. Their parents died too. And they've got their, their Auntie Lilith looking after them. Yes. My favourite person in the film, <laughs> BB Newer. It took me a while to figure out where I knew her from because it's like, wait, what? What is she? Why uh, do you? Is she from Fraser? She's Fraser's ex-wife. Oh, she is from. I, she's Fraser's she's, ex-wife. I mean, I've never. I don't know what. It's because she she looks so different because she's not playing that very stuck-up character. She's kind of got a more of a kind of cool nineties <laughs> grunge ant thing going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. But yeah, long story short, they find the board game in the attic, and there's it's a four player game. We established so they... that their the the pe- their parents have died, and so they're a bit sort of like in trauma. Uh, so mm. they're kind of kids out of place, I guess is is the idea. Give them some stakes, mm. and the boy mm. won't talk in front of anyone because he's, ex- but he will talk in front of his sister. So he's obviously not like a psychological problem. He's just fucking with people. Which she she loves to do as well, just by making up stories about how her parents died in these different ways. So and... they've got their weird sort of coping mechanisms they're dealing with. Yeah, yeah. Which I think are, are really nice ways of uh, giving the kids some character, actually, to be honest. Yeah. Like, it's, it's just a nice little way of dropping it in. And But yeah, they, they find the game. It's a four-player game, or two to four players, presumably. But um, the, the game that was started before one of the kids got sucked into the jungle and the other kid ran off down the street never to carry on playing um the pieces mm. are still locked in place the game's still happening how many years on so when these kids pick up the the dice and roll they're basically becoming players three and four in an old game little do they know so what's the first thing that attacks them is it the mosquitoes or is it the monkeys mosquitoes or the lion it's mosquitoes quickly followed by monkeys, but they mainly just cause havoc. I mean, they're dangerous, but uh, it's the lion that's yeah, the big, yeah. um, scary thing. And they quickly figure out all oh, the games doing it, and we have to complete the game to make it all go mm. away. So then he rolls the number that frees Alan Parrish. And uh, and so, yeah, Robin Williams comes out playing the kid who's grown up now, an adult, and he's got a big bushy beard. I, I don't know about you, but as a child, th- there's something about the idea that this kid was just trapped in this terrifying jungle that we never we never see. We only see stuff coming out of it, like the mist. But like the idea that he was trapped in the, the jungle for how many years and had to survive, and it, something about it really spoke to me. I I just found it very... Mm. Um, I don't know. It just It's like, that'd be awful. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, it's really terrifying because he's there for what twenty six years or something, and it's. But I think it also did a lot to um, endear me to the character, kind of instantly, and you kind of get the sense, oh, he's mm. he's he's the learned like tour guide of the game now. He knows this shit. He's been living with it. He knows what you know how to cope with things. And I like that he's lived in there for twenty six years, but he's you know only just completing his character journey of facing his fears. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You think twenty six years yeah. there? He's faced a lot of done that by now. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> they explain who everyone is and what's happened, and Robin Williams deals with the fact that it's decades later and everyone he loved mm. is dead. Or <laughs> well, that was the interesting uh, thing, really, that they didn't really go too far down that road. Like it just has the parent thing. But we don't have they much. Acknowledge it. We. D- I tell you what, there was nothing of which was interesting. There was nothing of like. Oh, a, a, a microwave oven. What's this? Oh, look at remote mm. control. What's this? They had none of that kind of time slip mm. stuff, which I think there's just there's not there was no mm. place for it. There's too much going yeah. on. It's like too many elements. Yeah, I think as a I think as a kid as well, that kind of stuff might be somewhat lost on you as well. Yeah, like as a child, I don't think I would have really had much concept that there wasn't a microwave oven twenty years ago and that sort of thing. Maybe, yeah. Hmm. Anyway, um, so they carry on playing the game. They convince, um, what's her name? Sarah, is it? Mm-hmm. Sarah. Yeah, they convince yeah. Sarah to carry on playing uh, so that they can finish the game and everything will go back to how it was. It's just a, yeah, it's just a big series of set pieces, but they're really great set pieces. 
Uh, my next note's about the quicksand one, which is at the very end when they're trying to roll mm. the dice. I thought that, that's a brilliant... Because it's really magical, fantastical. It's it's the floor just becomes, like, gooey, and he sinks into it. And it's... Again, quicksand's quite an old-school threat. That's something people used to be scared of in, like, yeah. the 60s and the 70s that never really gets mentioned uh-huh. anymore. So... I don't know, it, but you see, I think more than anything, it's just the imagery of Robin Williams like falling into the floor and his face kind of half in the floorboards <laughs> is so mm. fantastical and and fun and and sort of a bit scary at the same time. But well, it's actually there's there's a hell of a lot of stuff because there's a flood at one point with a giant crocodile. Yeah, uh, monsoon. There's, yeah. there's um. The boy turns into like a kind of monkey type of thing, and for uh, cheating, yeah, yeah, trying to cheat the system. There's a lot, a lot happens really, and yeah, then the, and then the they spiders, have a they have another face off uh, with the hunter in a in a department yeah. store, mm. and so you have that whole big set piece, mm. more stuff with the policeman. There's mm. a, there's a hell of it's just action, action, action. The hunter makes it back to the house as well. Don't forget, because um, mm. they have the big mm. standoff at the yeah. Um, Face your fears, and all going through this, this there's some kind of emotional story with. Alan and the boy. Um, what's the boy's name? Peter. Yeah. 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 Because Alan is sort of feeling, I guess, a bit like a father figure. Like there's that bit where Peter they lose the game potentially down this like stream, and Peter rushes and grabs it, and then he takes it back to them. And the women are all like, "Oh, well done, the Peter," women. and all this kind of stuff. And then they're like, <laughs> <laughs> and then they're nudging Alan, being like, "Come on, then, come on." You know, he did a good job, didn't he? And he's sort of quite gruff with him. Um, I guess he's supposed to be sort of like acting like his own dad, and that's like what he thinks father figures should act like, or he doesn't know how to, like he sees himself in Peter, or wishes he saw himself in Peter, I don't really know how to take it. Mm. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit clumsy, but basically it's just to get him on the path of, oh, I don't have to be like my father, I am allowed to show affection and emotion to this strange boy. Mm. Who's turning into a monkey. He's getting hair in places he never had hair before. <laughs> <laughs> I must hug him immediately. <laughs> anyway. Um, we haven't really mentioned those kids, have we? Because the actor, obviously, one of them, I don't know who he is, but the other one went on to be <laughs> well, famous actor. <laughs> yeah. Well, the kid, the, the boy voiced Chip in oh, yeah, Beauty yeah, and the yeah. Beast. That's his other claim to fame, but yeah. he... he He's not ah. really had much of a massively notable career since he hit puberty. Um, I think he's a jobbing actor still doing work, but but as you say, the other one mm. is Kirsten Dunst, uh, Kirsten Dunst, and they they are good. It's a good, solid, proper child actor yeah. performances, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, do you know what the weird thing is? While I was looking him up, she's only like six months older than he is. And he no, looks like, really? he's, like obviously the character was to be like two or three years younger. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. There you go. Huh. They were like both fourteen or something, thirteen, whatever. It was. Well, I guess girls do mature before boys. Well, she's just tall. She seems to be aging a lot slower than him now. If you look up <laughs> modern pictures of them. Uh, oh, do I want to? What's his name? Bradley Pierce. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's. I mean, it's you know, he's he's just aged like a person ages, but it's just sad to be reminded uh, that yeah. we're all gonna die one day <laughs> by looking at his face. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Yeah. You see what you mean? Good for him. <laughs> well, I I definitely have some questions about the ending. In which yeah. they they finish the game know. and and so it reverses every all the effects that it's caused and so everything goes back to normal as when you started the game. In this case, when they started the game was twenty odd years before, and so we go well, back. It it never quite like it says it will go back to how it was, which could just mean like people will turn human who've turned into monkeys, and the animals will go back to the monkey world and. The, the people inflicted with like weird diseases will be cured and that sort of thing. It doesn't state, oh, we'll rewind time to the point at which you started playing the game, mm. um, which is basically what happens. So Yeah, they don't yeah, know that's going to happen, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. But then when it does happen, they, they go back. So obviously the two little kids, they, they disappear. But the two older people who become children again are now back in their child's bodies, but with all these memories of 20-odd years of quite mm. traumatic, horrific events. Um, and, mm. I mean, I've got questions about that. Like, what is that the sequel? Like, them, them growing up in this kind of weird world where they've got <laughs> 30 years of knowledge and experience? Well, 
Is that what you're going to pitch to us? I, I don't know. Mm, no, because <laughs> it's just too traumatic to, to deal with. <laughs> Kids love trauma. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, so, so James and the Giant Peach, his kids were eaten. Not his kids. His his parents were eaten by a a rhino or something. But that, but that, but he had to sort of like like at the end of the film, old book rather story. They were still dead yeah. here. You know, it's I not mean, like he got to New York. He did York. deal yeah. with that by going into a peach with some animal friends. <laughs> I mean, the man, the man is clearly <laughs> certifiable. <laughs> Mm. Whereas here everything works out all right, and somehow mm. Judy and Peter are born. Yeah, and I, I must say I I don't quite buy that that Alan and Sarah were so endeared to these two kids in the day less than a day they spent yeah. together that they remember them for like how how thirty years is it? Yeah, twenty years, twenty six and- years. And and not only that, but when they see them, they're like so amazingly like it's like it's like they've been separated at birth, and they're like, oh my god, I can't believe I actually found you finally. It's like rather than just going, oh yeah, we didn't we work together once. And... I I think a more <laughs> realistic ending would be they largely completely forget about the kids, but they remember that they were orphaned, and they're kind of like, oh, you know what, we can we can like pull some strings to prevent their parents from being in that. Car crash, uh, <laughs> probably in a less full-on way than hiring them and forcing them to work so they can't go on that holiday. Like maybe you know, I don't know. But there's no subtlety to the ending, and and it's also I think the the the, the good ending that I would have liked would have been they go back their kids again, they get rid of the game, they throw it in the river or whatever, and then there's like this moment where it's like oh you know I think I'm I'm the, those memories are starting to fade. You know I almost can't remember what the Judy and Peter look like it. So we get we get a feeling that you know what they're going to go back to how they were. Or the memories are going as well. Mm. Um, the ending I would have liked is that they don't go back in time at all, and they mm, have yeah, to carry yeah. on picking up the pieces. But because the kids have you know been endeared to these two adults, then some nonsense happens where like they're able to like adopt them or something, and it's almost like this surrogate family that you know. Even though they have their mm. aunt, maybe the aunt died of malaria. So uh, <laughs> that's how I'd do it. No, not Bibi. <laughs> but it's, it's a bittersweet, tragic ending. Their, their aunt's dead. Their parents are dead. But you know, hey, they've got Robin Williams for a new dad, so that's pretty good. Uh-huh. Well, I think. Uh, mm. uh, uh, but yeah, the, the ending's all just a little bit too perfect, happy, nice, nice ending. Oh look, they're together. Yeah. Oh look, she's pregnant. Oh, look. It's just all a bit too much and of a sledgehammer of sugar to the face. Yeah. Oh, Christmas. Yeah, Christmas. Well, this film was a Christmas film, yeah, it wasn't was it? it? It came out in December. Well, it oh, must okay. Be. Yeah. It must be. I mean, if they set a, a bit of it at Christmas, then it's a Christmas film. So you guys you guys get on at me oh, no, for I calling oh, no, Die no, Hard sorry, a Christmas no, no, film. No, God, because what, have it's... Done? what have I done? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I just meant it was released around Christmas. You're saying Christmas. it's a Christmas I, film I because it's released at Christmas, but just because Die Hard's released in the summer, it's it's not a Christmas film. Yeah. No. Correct. No, 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 I'm not denying that Die Hard is a Christmas film. I think it's fine. I just, I don't think we need to belabor the point. So, uh, Jumanji, pretty much dealt with. Um, but as we've alluded to, if it made the edit, there was a sort of, a sort of sequel. Yeah. Have you guys seen Zathura? I've never seen it. I hadn't, and I watched it yesterday because I thought, oh, oh I've always meant to watch that. I've always sort of heard good well, things and it's supposed to be yeah, like Jumanji. I... I remember when it came out, and it got real... Like I don't think it did that well, numbers-wise. I don't think it was a particularly big deal. But I do remember a lot of critics making a point of it being a really nice little family film and saying, no, you know what, this is well worth your time, and you should check it out, and it's really underrated, and it's great. So I, I made a point of you know watching it when it was on TV one day, back when I, I, I used to watch films on TV... This isn't a sequel, but it is an adaptation of the book, which was a sequel to the book Jumanji was based on. Is Mm -hmm. that yeah correct? I believe so. It's 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 basically like a spiritual sequel, and you could watch it as a sequel. It's definitely the same concept. I mean, it's Jumanji in space. Oh yeah, quite literally. It's Jumanji, but the board game is sci-fi rather than jungle. Uh, And it was John Favreau's um, one of his earlier directorial efforts. Yeah, it was between um, Elf and Iron Man. That's This is what mm. he did. This was his kind of like oh. throw some effects at him and see what yeah. he does with them. 
But it's a oh, but it's a very small film uh, that is exactly compared to what I said, Jumanji. Yeah. Even though they're in outer space and there's all this massive stuff happening, it feels very intimate and little. Oh, very, and... very small. But my well, my reaction to the fact that it was obviously so small budget, so small was my response to that was this feels like a team that have done a really great job with a small budget. Mm. It, it felt to me like they'd done a lot with what they'd got, if you mm. know what I mean. Because it felt like a small budget done well rather than a big budget not used well, if, if that makes sense. If that, they, they, there was yeah. a lot of good set design. They put money into it. The effects they had worked. It was kind of married. The, they had a big robot puppet, but then sometimes it was computer animated, and but it worked. And the, the monster things, mm. the, 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 the alien that they encounter are these big giant lizard people. And then you don't see them for ages. Oh, and when you, those aliens when you finally do, it's kind of, it looks a bit like 1994 animatronic kind of things. It, but it's kind of, it has got a nostalgic kind of quirkiness to it. Of course, it's actually the, the queen uh, and, um, and the president uh, who actually really <laughs> just lizard aliens. <laughs> <laughs> We're just putting that in. Hashtag our, David Icke. Our, <laughs> <laughs> our analytics, yeah. The lizard people Brilliant. are attacking. <laughs> And what I liked about Zathura, like those two kid actors are pretty solid, but what I liked about Zathura in terms of their relationship was they felt like quite real kids, like that older kid, he mm. just can't be bothered with his brother and he's like quite mopey, rather than like sparky kids that are usually in films. The, their relationship felt very realistic, I liked it. Yeah, and at one point, one of them name drops Super Smash Brothers, which I thought, like, <laughs> oh, that's good on the writer. They've researched a, a real game kids play instead of just <laughs> saying Nintendo. <laughs> Probably the most notable cast member. Uh, Dax Shepard, who plays an astronaut who, mm. like, shows up halfway through and is, like, sort of their Alan from Jumanji kind of role. Because for a long time, and it doesn't show up quite way in, and for a long time I thought, they're going to do this whole film with just these two kids. Like, that's really brave. Mm. And then they brought Dax Shepard into it. And and uh, that character, Dax Shepard, just... Uh, it just hasn't got enough personality to pull it off. What, it, it again, what? Maybe you can help me out with this. But like, what is Dak Shepard? What is he? I don't get it. In a, in like a stoner comedy, he works. It is fine. But I've never seen him do any sort of sincere emotional sincere emotional stuff. I probably best know him from Idiocracy, where he plays like stupider than stupid character, and it it works because he's like like you say, he plays to that kind of stoner comedy level it, it, it felt yeah. like a really kind weird of, like he, yeah like he wants to be to Dane Cook or someone like that and it's just yeah. not quite got but in this this character and you can even tell with the the words like the the actual dialogue and the script he's supposed to be like a real kind of it's he it just needs so much more personality to bring it to life I think that I don't I don't think this is a matter of a badly written character I think he's just not getting hold of it yeah it, it feels like a character written for a Chris Pratt type that kind of cheeky yeah, chappy yeah, with a yeah, sparkle yeah, in their yeah. eye it struck me like a really odd choice <laughs> basically mm. when he showed up in the film but actually when i looked him up like dak shepherd at the time it was one of the first things he did he wasn't like an established uh he wasn't dak shepherd at that point so i guess yeah. he was kind of an outsider really outside yeah. there ultimately i wasn't that impressed with zathura to be honest like it it's fine but i think people had acted like it was this great little undiscovered gem and i i thought it was a fairly mediocre kids film it was it you know it was fine i'm sure i would have sat through it happily enough as a child it is just a bit too much a too much of a okay here's the next thing here's the next like there was no real mm. meaning to it and the ending kind of pulled it together a bit but mm. um it, it was i yeah but i enjoyed it and i i kind of liked this old school nature about it, it felt like a small film mm. that was doing well and, and so i that yeah. I, I kind of responded to that i think well, I, I think it's very weird that it's taken them so long to make a, a real sequel. And with that smooth segue, let's talk about the new Jumanji <laughs> film coming out. Well, they, yeah, it's, no, but it's just, it's it so clearly lends itself to being a franchise, doesn't it? Yeah. it you, you just do the same thing And especially again. now, um, like, especially if you wanted to wait a few years and think, okay, we've got the technology now, let's go, now we do some, we go into the jungle world and we, we kind of do it in that world. The obvious sequel is 
you just pick up at the end of the first one for whatever reason they have to play it again or they're sucked in or whatever and yeah they go into the jungle and that is the obvious sequel but if you have to wait 20 years and then put an all new cast in there i don't think that's the obvious sequel i think the obvious mm. sequel is you do more or less the same thing again for a modern audience yeah. uh, i'm kind of getting into my pitch here uh, so I'm just gonna like <laughs> fold that in here because my pitch is essentially just that you do it for a modern audience, um, the same thing again. Because I think you, it, it, much like the argument with the Force Awakens, you need to kind of re-establish what this is. It's this stuff invading your the real world. It's not you going on an adventure to the jungle. It's the jungle coming to you. Much like Terminator doesn't work when it's set in the future. It has to be robots invading the present well especially if what they're doing now is updating it to be a video game rather than a board game and it, yeah. it strikes me as really messy that they're kind of doing two concepts at once there because to me surely you update it to be a video game or you do they go into the jungle and to me the obvious thing would have been modernize it so it's a video game but like the video game stuff comes into the real world and you can play off it being digital somehow And then those characters, Mm. if the film is successful enough, do a sequel where they go to the jungle. Because the trailer, to me, largely just looks like a kind of... Well, a very different film to Jumanji. It kind of just looks like a Kong Skull Island, King Kong... Mm. uh, And they're definitely going down a full-on comedy route. Which Jumanji is comic, but it's uh, it's a a kid's action film with comedy bits rather than a comedy film. And I don't think it's the worst thing in the world if they do go full comedy with it, Mm, because it it lends itself to it. (laughs) But, um, you know, again, I would have preferred something a bit more sincere, but I don't, you know, I think that'll work. I'm not sure where the emotional resonance is going to come from, because you haven't got the kids, you haven't got a father-son relationship thing going on. It's just, like, they're teenagers. Eh, Well, maybe. But they're teenagers, and then they're kind of in the bodies of adults, so it's like... Yeah, I'm not sure. Which I find really weird mm. when, when I f- first... Because I thought seeing the promotional material and stuff, I just thought, oh, okay, it's Dwayne Johnson and Karen Gillian and Jack Black and, you know, they just go and into the into the world of the game. But it's not. It's other... It's teenagers and then Dwayne Johnson is like their avatar. Yeah. Um, but, um, which is, is which it's a seems... nice concept, but it, again, it's not... Jumanji, it's kind of its own thing, and it, it yeah. like I yeah. say, it just kind of yeah. feels like too many new elements being introduced for this to be a Jumanji sequel. It just feels like it's a completely mm. different. Well, thing. I think we we are far we are far enough away from Jumanji now that they can just go, okay, look, this is a reboot. Okay, let's just get we can we're doing well, something it, yeah. different with it. I've got yeah. to, I've got to say though, I mean, I'm I'm looking forward. I want to watch this film. I, it's got Dwayne the Rock Johnson, my was, per, well, my yeah, current it's your favorite. Film, it? yeah. my, it's got Jack Black, who in in that kind of tropic thunder role where he's the supporting part, not the main player. That's where he works. He's the quirky comedy. Mm. He's playing a teenage girl. I was going to say it's, it's Jack Black playing a perfect. teenage girl. So uh, that then, is very you know Kevin good. Hart is like very hot right now. I'm not, I haven't really seen much of his stuff, but he's you know he's big. I, honestly, this film just ticks a lot of boxes for me. It, it's exactly the sort of broad comedy that I respond to, even though <laughs> I know it's not that good. It's Dwayne yeah. the Rock Johnson <laughs> doing comedy character acting. This is like this is my official most anticipated <laughs> film of the year, guys. This is I'm, I'm putting a seal on it. <laughs> Big Al's uh, award for most anticipated film of the year, 2017. I was going to say just out of what's wow. left, or <laughs> no, for the whole year, because to- you you know uh, we've talked about this before. I don't get excited about anything this is this is one of the few films where i've gone oh i want to see that i want to see the disaster artist because i think that's really interesting story this i just want to see because it's like proper like how you're supposed to view cinema it's like i want to go and see that as just as a silly fun experience and it'd be a nice evening out Mm. like how cinema is supposed mm. to be appreciated (laughs) if i was going purely off the trailers i would be so just angry that this film's been made and (laughs) because it does just seem like because it seems like such a just like we're going to use Jumanji, the branding, but without doing anything yeah, remotely yeah. tied to Jumanji and just a completely different tone. And But early buzz is that it's like surprisingly good fun and I can completely believe it because to, to look at the trailers, it's one of those films that could easily go either way and could be like great fun or could just be total horseshit. Well, I'm, I'm excited. 
I hope they remove those uh, jungle drum <laughs> uh, those bongo <laughs> drum things. I mean, God. You couldn't do that in this day and age. Yeah. <laughs> PC no, gone mad. No. It's, it's too much. It's too much. Uh, well, so you kind of touched on your pitch during all that. Um, did you have any more oh, details? Or we, was it... Uh, not really. My, my pitch is just like, do it again. Um, and I realise that's not very good, so I've done I've done that thing where I also come up with some shit pun versions to like offset it, like I did for the Blair Witch Project. Okay. Hmm. You could have German German Angie, <laughs> where um, it's the same, but instead of the jungle, it's Germany. So like they roll the dice, and some like like one of those umpa umpa bands comes out and starts Ooh, making a that's rough, very like, ominous tra- trashing the kitchen, making a noise. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that sort of thing, yeah. Jam, jam, <laughs> Angie, and at the end, Robin. It's the same, but Robin Williams uh, falls into a vat of jam instead of quicksand at the end. What about um, Jim Angie? It's um, it's a quiet drama about Jim and Angie, a middle aged couple played by Alfred Molina and Emma Thompson. <laughs> yeah. That's my pitch. I've, I've just come up with it. <laughs> or Jermaine Greer Angie. <laughs> what? And that's that's uh, they roll the dice, but like then Jermaine Greer pops out and starts telling them off, for, <laughs> like because the boy rolls first, and she's like, "That's that's not on me." Well, that's male. She privilege. says she's been stuck in this culturally insensitive <laughs> land for like the past twenty six years, and all she hears are these drums. What about Jew Woman G? Ah. Hello? Oh, right, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that one had to... Uh, that one took some working out. Good. That had the impact I was looking for. <laughs> uh, yeah. we'll, we'll, like edit, we'll edit the big pause out so that it just sounds like we both got it right away. <laughs> okay. Um, any more? I'm trying to think of... Toe, Jumanji and Earl. That's that's some uh, that's some n- nostalgia for nineties kids right there. Oh, Blue Manji, uh, which the blue, <laughs> the blue Manji um, out of a board game and attack everyone with pipes. <laughs> yeah, and 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 that take like there's this really ominous like elaborate drumming whenever they, <laughs> <laughs> when they see the board game. It's like just these weird blue men doing like this weird drum show. <laughs> okay um well i've got a pitch but i wanted to do kind of like what the the new film is doing they sort of updated it but my mine is going to be one of those quiz games because i like quiz games you know the one we used to play at uni and you have to hit the button and press the buttons and shit what was that called? buzz buzz right that was what it's called oh. so like that that game but like who voiced f- that jason jason donovan jason donovan yeah yeah, yeah. cool but like that, but um, like a film-themed game. And so every question, they get like drawn into the world of that film, oh, the question's about. Let's see a clip, and then... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. But I thought that would be too expensive to recreate films. Um, That's basically sets. what Ready Player One is, like... How is it? Isn't it? <laughs> well, I was thinking of uh, Last Action Hero, that kind of idea. It's, it'd be all right. If, if you got... If you, if you did it, like... Under Disney or a company that owns hundreds yeah, of films, the right and you just, would be just draw from movie. their pool of properties. But I did think it might be easier to have things come out, and like you were saying earlier, so that probably has more of an impact anyway. Mm. So instead of you getting drawn in, things come out, and then so like you have a question about Star Trek, and like Captain Kirk comes out, and then you have to like go on an adventure with him, and but you're trying to find an answer to a particular quiz question. But I was thinking you could you could do whatever you want, and then that's that's down to. The writer. So I thought you you guys might be able to come up with that. So what if it was had a James Bond question? Uh, like, say the question is, what is the name of Scaramanga's sidekick in that film with Scaramanga? And then, Nick and then hey. they all, but then they come out, is it and really, they, and they yeah. attack you. Well done. Yeah, oh, no, I haven't even seen that one. Brilliant. <laughs> well, and then Hervé then, Lachey comes out of the game and attacks you. Yeah, and then but then yeah. but then James, whichever Bond it is, comes out and helps you. And then they run off, and then you have to go and like, and he goes, you go, what's that little dwarf's name? And he goes, I can't tell you because you, you, I need your help. So if you come and help me defeat them, then I'll tell you his name. And then mm-hmm. they, and then they were, and then so stuff like that, right? Yeah. Um, or what about an Evil Dead question? 
Ooh. Huh? Yeah, go on. Like, try me. Um, <laughs> uh, what's a good evil day? What are the words? The 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 word this magic Klaatu, word you have to say? Barada. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then Bruce Campbell comes out, and it's actually Bruce Campbell because he's available, and yeah, he yeah, and he runs around and sort of treads brilliant. on a rake, and it whacks him in the face and stuff. He's not sideshow boss. <laughs> That's the sort of joke. But hey, they could pop on the the Fraser quiz set. Yes. <laughs> get, uh, get Kelsey Grammer popping up. Is uh, it's not as Frasier. action-packed. Um, it's funnier though, isn't it? <laughs> no, the question the question is, what wine goes best with tossed salad and scrambled eggs? And then you have to uh, you have to work out the answer, you, and you what you have to go on a trip with uh, Kelsey Grammer to the local uh, winery, and you, <laughs> and you sample things, and you decide what what will go best with a cold bit of pork. Oh, that's brilliant! <laughs> I'd love. That. I, but if it's but if it's Kelsey Grammer rather than Fraser, then I don't think he would be spitting the alcohol out after sampling it, and I think he'd get like really drunk, and he'd become quite aggressive. To be honest, like. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the conflict for uh, that part of the film. <laughs> I like that idea, Alan. Is there more to it, or is that? Uh, it? Well, no. I mean, you make as much as you want if you come up with your own uh, little round levels. But yeah, I guess at the end you succeed, you win, and then Jason Donovan gives you a toaster or whatever it was. So, the end of the yeah. Game. No, I think I think that would work really well. That's that's where movies are headed, all folding in on themselves and like. Having characters from other films show up and everything. And that's yeah, all. It's just the rights issue you have to work around. Pick a sizable studio and you'll have a lot to work with. What studio did Jumanji, for example? Let's see how we can, how many we can get. Um, Come on, Calvin, you're good with studios. Where Sony. You, where, where, where's Jumanji on your shelf? <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, Columbia TriStar, I believe, um, which is now Sony. Um, oh well, there you go. So you can you can probably use Spider Man. Only by contractual agreement with Marvel. <laughs> yeah, it's a different guy playing Spider Man. Sony own the the right; they can do what they want with Spider Man. Oh, Marvel are basically Ooh. leasing him back from them. If anything, that's you kind could of get funny. Kirsten Dunst back in it. Oh yeah, tie yeah. in. Yeah. Oh, Resident Evil. They're Sony mm-hmm. films. I guess. Well, I mean, they can't all be winners. <laughs> Godzilla. Well, there you go. The 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 remake from the nineties. Imagine the chaos that would cause. He's your third act. Matthew like... Broderick loose in New York. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Behind the wheel. <laughs> no, 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 it's not funny. Um, okay, <laughs> let's wrap this up, Calvin. Yeah, finish us off. With it. Take us home, son. Right, so we've already established that B.B. New Earth is in this film, who played yes. Frasier's uh, ex-wife, oh, Lilith Sternin, on Frasier. So it reminded me of the episode <laughs> of Frasier, where Frasier is playing chess with his dad, and he can't <laughs> and he can't get over the fact that Martin, his dad, is actually be- really good at chess and keeps on beating him and beating him and beating him. And then he eventually beats his dad, and then he can't... He's obsessed with the idea that his dad let him win. So uh, we're going to be doing a sequel to that episode of Frasier. Okay, yeah, good. But they're playing Jumanji. Well, uh, <laughs> no. Oh. Oh, okay, maybe they could play Jumanji, actually. I, I had it a different <laughs> way. I'll, I'll tell you what I had. I guess this could be Jumanji, but anyway. Um, so Frasier's really pissed off at his dad still about being better at him at chess. Frasier starts to blame the chess set that they've got because he thinks that his dad has like rigged it. It's got to... microchips in it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, he, so he's on the lookout for a new chess set. Anyway, him and Niles are in a shady district of uh, the city because Maris has asked Niles to find enough ivory to sculpt a gigantic uh, <laughs> sculpture of her father, her late father, is... the Admiral. Wait a minute. Is that the enough... sort of thing her character would do in the show? Yeah. Try and yeah. get ivory? You say... <laughs> You say um, enough ivory to build this as if you're going to melt it down and make one big ivory. <laughs> That's not how it works. I don't know how it works. <laughs> yeah, it's actually, like, how would two You'd have to glue like <laughs> loads of different little chunks of ivory together to make a statue. That would be really difficult. I don't know. Just a massive elephant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, you know where you could get an elephant that big? I bet, is uh, the jungles of Jumanji. I bet they've got a giant Uh, elephant. Oh, see, I could have tied this in better than I 
<laughs> Even though we see normal sized elephants in that stampede, I reckon there's some big fuckers in the game. Well, yeah, what are they running demon. away from? Yeah. The big the big elephant. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be fooled, it isn't thunder. So anyway, they're um, they're in this shady district and they happen upon this uh, this shop where uh, this young boy takes them along because he says, oh, my grandfather's got enough ivory for you and a shop of other things. Anyway, they go in and uh, they meet Mr. Wing, who owns the shop. Uh, Played by James James Hong. <laughs> I like that and... James Hong's sort of become a, one of our little mascots almost lately. He's just kind of snuck in very subtly. <laughs> Anyway, Niles gets his ivory and Fraser's like looking around the shop and he sees all these strange artifacts from faraway lands and he happens upon this very elaborate looking chess set and uh, he's he inquires about it. He's like, well, that's a very interesting chess set. I'm I'm into my antique. So what? Uh, where, where's this from? Bloody blah, blah. Mr. Wing like says, oh no, that's a that shouldn't be out there. What what's this doing out here, boy? Why did you bring this out here? And he's like scolding his grandson and he's saying like, you must leave this in the chest. And uh, the <laughs> oh, grandson... why, why why am I getting this terrible feeling that Mr. Wing is played by Rob Schneider <laughs> <laughs> in Calvin's version? <laughs> What film was it where Rob Schneider did that? Remind me. I, I don't he did know. That. It must be an Adam Sandler film. He's, oh, he's definitely done it. I can't think what it was. So yeah, uh, but Frasier really likes the chess set, so he, he pays off the grandson and takes the chess set home to uh, to his dad. So Niles is uh, trying to put together this giant ivory sculpture of Maris's late father, um, and Frasier's <laughs> playing his dad at chess, but is. Uh, you know that that he's getting ready to play the game, and his dad's like, "No, no, no, I don't want to. I don't want to play. I don't want to play." And Fraser's like, "Oh no, come on, you've got to." And uh, then Daphne comes out of a room, and uh, Roz comes to the flat, and then <laughs> Martin and Fraser start playing. And then as they start playing, oh. they get sucked into the chess set, and all of a sudden they're in medieval England, or or rather a, an alternate dimension, which looks and is a lot like hate medieval that. England. Um, well, you know, we we have lots of fun. Daphne is, of course, being English herself. She is uh, hailed as a queen. Do they understand her accent? Yeah. Is, uh, <laughs> no, no, that's the thing, because she's got this really common accent in the show, but they... Uh... They go to a tavern and ask for some uh, tossed salad and, and scrambled eggs. And the guy's <laughs> like, what, what are you talking about? Scrambled Talk- eggs, that's a French thing, isn't it? Get out of here. What are you French. all about? And he's like, mm. he's like, just some lettuce. And he's like, oh, vegetables. We got lots of them here, them vegetables. <laughs> and he like gives him a big turnip or something. And mm. sc- scrambled eggs. Ooh, la da. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, we have like sitcom out, fish out of water stuff. Um, and it all sort of is like medieval England. And then out of nowhere, these giant chess pieces appear. They're like <laughs> sixty foot high. It's like a um, a kaiju film, but with these giant chess sets destroyed. So it's yeah. so it's not it's not like they have to battle a knight ah. to represent the knight in the chess game and that sort of thing. It's well, just a giant <laughs> chess piece crushing people. Well, these giant <laughs> chess pieces are crushing people, and then. It's uh, because they've got him with the king now, because the king's a bachelor and he took a shine to Daphne, so they're in with him. And he says, fortunately, my uh, my scientists uh, were working on our own giant chess pieces, so then it's revealed that the, the crown have their own giant... Uh, our scientists. Chess pieces. <laughs> It's a different dimension. In medieval England. It's a different dimension. Did, did, did scientists <laughs> exist back then? Alchemists. You had monks doing the odd bit of research. Yeah, I guess alchemists trying to figure out specifically making things turn into gold. Anyway, they're about to deploy these uh, chess pieces to go and destroy the invading ones, but Martin and uh, Fraser quickly work out that the chess pieces are in fact moving like chess pieces would in reality, so the pawns are only moving like one hop at a time, the bishop's only moving diagonally, that sort of thing. So they have to use their chess playing skills to defeat these giant kaiju chess <laughs> pieces. Um, and Martin, uh, he's leading, obviously, and Fraser's getting really uppity about it and pissed off. Don't their own chess pieces cause, like, equal amounts of damage to the kingdom by, like, <laughs> jumping over to fight them? Well, yeah, but it's for the greater good. <laughs> right. Collateral damage. Yeah, yeah. So Martin 
is obviously leading the way and Fraser's getting really pissed off because he's, you know, making bad decisions and stuff and Martin's having to come in and sort it out. Um, and eventually Fraser makes one decision which leads to Martin get, getting knocked off a roof or something and he breaks his other leg. He breaks his other hip or whatever. No, not other hip. The same <laughs> hip, but again. Um, and so Fraser has to take control himself and win based on the advice of his father. <laughs> and then they get transported back and uh, then Niles and Fraser have a sherry and <laughs> the dog runs in. Oh, can we have... Uh, Niles has built this giant, like, Jenga tower of ivory and then the dog <laughs> runs in and grabs one, pulls out and they all fall down and he goes, That darn dog! <laughs> <laughs> that sounds, yeah, perfect. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, then please go and revisit our back catalogue at our website, dimreturns.com, where we also post reviews and other general film information. Join us next week when we will be getting together for a cosy Christmas dinner and a chat about a Christmas film, which is not the sort of thing we would usually watch, but I'm sure it's one that we will all come to love, actually. <laughs>